in five, four, three, two, one. Of the loves I've known and lost, one's left me here to pain. Like shadows on the tides of unforgiving time She comes back to me When songs whispering her name She always smells like rain Lost her in a summer storm, a cold September kiss. All I ever wanted is all I always miss. And she comes back to me. Love's canvas torn and stained She always smells like Rain can set me free and Rain can wash me clean Set the rivers raging She always smells like rain Forming in the west I feel her through my window Hear her rustling in the leaves Whichever way the wind blows She comes back to me She always smells like rain. Like rain. Welcome to this week's edition of the Wispy Mop Music Acoustic Radio Podcast Series. I'm your host, Todd, middle initial C. Walker. Yes, that's right, it's me. And we have been listening to the song titled... Obviously, because it's in the song, Smells Like Rain, by a young gentleman who's based out of the greater Baltimore, Maryland area named Tony Danikis. And let me read you what Gary Allen, and Gary Allen, just so people know who he is, played with J.J. Cale, the Charlie Daniels Band, and Stonewall Jackson, just to name a few. But this is what he wrote about Tony. Tony Danikis has garnered so much praise and reviews that I wasn't left with hardly any adjectives for my own review. There's a warmth and natural soulfulness to his sound that is as much approachable as it is admirable. Next time I sit beside Prine at Arnold's Meet and Three, I'm going to hip him to the fact that I know who's going to fill his shoes when he retires. That was Gary Allen. And the gentleman he was referring to, Tony Danikis, is on the phone with me right now. Hi, Tony. Hi, how are you? I am very well. And that's high praise. I, there were two or three other quotes from people, um, two gentlemen from Europe, and I read these off your website, which is TonyDenikis.com. And for those of you folks listening, Denikis is spelled D-E-N-I-K-O-S. 
And it's not Tony Danikis, it's Tony Danikis, right, Tony? <laughs> That's right. I said it wrong for so many years, and one day you came up and said, just to let you know, it's Danikis. <laughs> <laughs> Now you've had a well. First of all, that's a fairly recent song, isn't it? Yeah, we. I just released that as a single in the last week. Oh, so I found it when it was brand new. Brand spanking new. Yes. Very cool. And I found it on YouTube. Is it anywhere else? It's on all of the streaming um, platforms: iTunes, it's uh, Amazon, it's on Spotify, and on and on. So yes. So many, many, many streaming um, platforms. Well, if I'm not mistaken, let's see, you have three, four, five, five CDs to date, is plus the, the few new songs that you have. Am I correct? Yeah, that's right. I've got um, started putting out CDs in late 90s and just continued on through 2020. <clears throat> and uh, then I've released, I think, about six singles in the last year. So. Now, where do you do your recording? Well, I, I've recorded historically all over the place. Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of my recording at the Wooden Stone Room with mm -hmm. Scott Smith. And, uh, and he's uh, located in Baltimore. Now, how do you go about choosing a recording studio? Do you do it by referral from somebody else? Or is it you run into somebody and they go, oh, I have a recording studio? Well, so years ago, I mean, I've been sort of using the same guys for a few years. When I was making uh, albums... Um, you know, full albums. I'd, I'd go out to Nashville and do the um, the rhythm section with uh, with Tim Beery and um, you know Danny Gatton and Frank Marino and the Lofgren fame. And um, then he'd pull in some bassists. So I met Tim uh, through Gant Kushner, who I was recording with uh, down at Gizmo Recording. And um, all of this started in the uh, early 90s when um, I won a couple of awards and won some money and some free studio time with a fellow by the name of Michael Brown uh, down at, uh, in, at, his, at his studio. And I, I hired a guy to come play trombone on a song. And he said, you ought to check out Gant Kushner. And so I did. And then Gant turned me on to Tim Berry. I needed a drummer. So when Tim wasn't touring with Nils Lofgren, he would play with us and um i you know Gant became a guitar player and so we played together and then i started recording with tim and of course um i've known jen smith uh since you know the early 90s and her husband scott smith and i uh, became friends and i started recording vocals uh at his house back in the early 2000s so i basically been using the same people for the last you know really 20, 30 years. Um, and it just sort of depends on whether or not I, you know, what kind of rhythm section I really want to use and what kind of sound I'm after, you know. So I'll probably be doing a little bit more recording with Scott Smith at Wooden Stone Room. I've been working with him a lot lately, but uh, I'll probably be working with Kay Kushner again in the future as well. I also did some recording with uh, Ray Tilkins, who, uh, who used to work with uh, Rupoy Slim. He was uh, Rupoy Slim's guitarist for for a good long while, but uh, ambient recording, I've recorded some songs with him too over the years as well. So it's kind of like an incestuous thing. They all know each other. I've actually had Gay Kushner sit in on other studios and record guitar. and So, you know, it's kind of unusual to have other studio owners going to other studios and doing recording, but I've, I've, <laughs> we've had all that sort of stuff going on, so it's been fun. Well, it must be comfortable for you knowing these people so that when you do go into the studio, you're nerve level is lowered that's a really great point um because uh i used to you know, do projects and starts and fits you know um it would take a while to get comfortable wherever you're at but the fact that i've been with these guys for so long now <clears throat> um it is something different that happens when the little red light comes on you know so it takes a while to sort of relax and sort of come yourself and, and sort of you know try to uh to extend yourself a little bit and be creative. Uh, and I think comfort levels are really important. So yeah, I would agree with you. Now, the one thing that so many songwriter, performing songwriters tell me is the most nerve wracking thing they do in the studio is having to play to a click track. Does it bother you? It's a different thing. And, uh, it, that took a while to get used to that. 
I'm much better with it now. But yeah, the click track is a, a, an interesting um, thing. And it's, I think the volume of it's really important to make sure that you have to set the right volume or it'll be over, overpowering or you'll start to lose it and then you'll start to um, possibly get out of tempo. Yeah, I, I call it chasing the click track. Yes, yes. And I, the the words I hate to hear is the the studio engineer saying, "Okay, do that again." You were you were trying to catch up, but you were actually in front of it. <laughs> right, exactly. And and with acoustic finger style picking, and I do quite a bit of it, as you uh, know, um, it's not it's not always easy to grid your guitar, you know, after the fact. So it's uh, you're going to have to get a groove going. So yeah, it's tough. Now you had mentioned we earlier when you were um, referring to something. So there must have been. Did you play in bands for a long time, or you have have you always been more or less a solo artist who occasionally went out with groups of people? I started off as a bassist um, decades ago, decades and decades ago, um, and then so I was in a band uh, for a few years, and then I went and started playing down in Norfolk. Uh, you might be familiar with my song Norfolk Town, yes. um, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, so that's basically you know a chronological biography of, of that time down there. But I uh, started playing solo acoustic out um, back, you know, and then did that for probably twenty five years or so. Um, and then I that when I I won that that I saves me my song saves me that's on uh, uh, under the church. Um, that's where I won some awards. And when I started putting full blown um, songs together, producing songs in the studio, I then went and put a band together based on the studio musicians that I was Dan Kushner and then um, a fellow by the name of Greg Hemming, uh, the bassist that uh, uh, I was lucky enough to play with. He played with Bobby Manriquez and others. Um, and then uh, I got my, my uh, drummer. Uh, who played Trigger Happy for years up in Baltimore area, uh, Rick Weisenmiller. And once we put that band together, that was in late 90s, uh, early 2000s, and I kept the band together for about 20 years. Uh, all the while doing solo shows, as you know. That's how I got to know you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so your wonderful productions and uh, your support uh, in the region. And, um, and put together, you know, some duos and trios as well, so... I've played with Angie Miller. Um, Angie and I have been working together on a project recently. And Angie Miller and, um, and Thomas Friedrich uh, on percussion, we did a little trio thing. So I've been doing sort of like a solo duo trio and band thing for about 20 something years recently because of COVID, but we do a lot less band work. So I've been doing a lot more acoustic stuff lately. Well, that song "Save Me," which is on the Under the Church CD, you said that was a, an award-winning song. When? Well, see, I first put that out on as Tony D E uh, because nobody could pronounce my name, Todd. <laughs> 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 and uh, funny story, I was playing a gig in uh, Northern Virginia, and somebody, and it was Tony D E because I didn't want to be Tony D because I didn't want people to think I was running a pizza joint, right? And uh, and somebody came, and it was the Tony D band, right? And somebody came up to me and said, "Tony the band, is that you?" <laughs> and I was like, "If you're going to mispronounce my name, I might as well mispronounce my my you know first name." So, um, but yeah, so I put that out under Tony D. It's an album called Naked and Smiling, um, and that was in the '90s. That I put that late '90s when I won the award. Save Me's on that. Um, but I decided to redo it later once I learned a few tricks, and I think I got a little bit better at producing music. So I put it, I put it on another record. So. Well, let's do this for the folks who are listening. L- let me play about 30 seconds of the Save Me from the Tony D um, CD, and then we'll play it from Under the Church so they can hear the, <laughs> the, the difference. Is that okay with you? <laughs> That'll be fun, yeah. All right, here's, here it is it, as it was recorded originally. Got a notion 
So that was the original version. And let's see if I can find... Here it is. This is from the CD Under the Church. I've got a notion I'm going down Like a twister in the middle of the sweet blue ocean Man, I'm sinking ever deeper And my world is spinning round I don't know how to feel Well, it's definitely the same song, just done differently Yep, done with slightly different production And a little bit more emphasis on... uh, on a few things, you know, uh, and, and it's just, uh, shoot, it was 10 years later, you know, so the song had sort of evolved a little bit from playing it out for 10 years. Now, is that the only song that you re-recorded over the years? Actually, no, and I just, uh, I, I started having a look at some of those songs on Naked and Smiling, and there's a couple that I really, really like, but felt like, um, I had learned a few things, so I just released probably a month ago a re-recording of "Mama Drinks a Bit." I just saw that on the uh, the list of songs on on Save Me. Yeah, and uh, and I really liked the way it came out, and it's a little different than the original. Uh, the original was just me and a guitar and a harmonica, and this time I added uh, a beautiful piano, a pianist. Uh, and his name is eluding me. He's going to kill me. He lives in Portugal, though. He's uh, worked with the Neville brothers and others. A really, really great pianist. Hang on, I can't remember his name. That's quite all right. We're going to do the same thing with Mama Drinks a Bit. How about that? Awesome. Here, here comes the original version. My mama <laughs> drinks a bit. And my grandma blames my daddy with a vengeance. Cause he acts as if he could not give a damn But it's killing him, I know he can't hide it Lord, I know just how it feels deep inside it Lord, I know, good God, I know my daddy knows And here's the, uh, the current version my mama drinks a bit And my grandma blames my daddy with a vengeance Cause he acts as if he couldn't give a damn And it's killing him, I know He can't hide it Lord, I know just how it feels Deep inside Lord, I know Good God, I know My daddy knows It must be fun to uh, revisit a song like that. Well, it really is. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is I actually, on both versions, later in the song, um, you know, I, I enter in some different chord progressions that I've learned over the years to sort of emphasize certain emotions at certain times. So the original version of that song, for instance, there's no minor chords at all being played uh, until I hit the bridge. Um, but in the later version, I actually resolve the end of a verse um, on a minor chord every now and again, um, or use a minor chord to get to it at the end of the verse, which really gives it a whole different feel. And so it's really, it's really neat. Um, to take what you've learned over the years and then sort of like apply it. So um, to sort of flesh out, you know, certain things about a song that you want to, that you want to magnify you know, and focus on. So Now, you said you learned it over the years. Was it something where someone said, hey, you know, in that song you're doing, you could go here before you go there? Or is it something where you just happened upon it one day? I sort of learned from, from uh, listening to other songwriters, you know. I've, I've been... Um, 
you know, uh, Smells Like Rain, for instance, is done in a tuning that I learned listening to Richard Thompson. Mm -hmm. um, I was learning um, Vincent Black Light in 1952, that song. And um, the tuning is kind of unique. I, I think perhaps European folkies might do it a lot more than, than American folkies do, but I, I don't know that for sure. But I, I hadn't been familiar with it, and so... Um, just learning new stuff, picking up stuff from Jason Isbell, another favorite of mine, and other songwriters. And as I've sort of uh, learned and picked up other people's stuff, I kind of said, you know, that'd be really cool to sort of implement this here or there. And um, and so, you know, as we explore our creative sort of juices, you know, we kind of, as songwriters, as, as you well know, Todd, <laughs> um, you know, start to try different things here and there and I've, I've stumbled upon a few progressions that I was like, that really sounds cool in this song. I'm going to go ahead and, and do that. So uh, I think there's a couple of the songs on that album I might re-record. Well, you uh, know, one of, one of the things is um, you have a way with words. And I, I say that and, and many songwriters do. We're, and we're all slightly different in how we do it. And you have... Numerous times when you played at the now defunct Monday Night Songwriter uh, series at Brewers Alley, you would you would say, "I'm really a, honestly, I'm actually an, a happy guy." And the reason <laughs> you would say that is because some of your songs are, are I won't say depressing, but they're very somber. Right. Not all. You've got some very humorous ones. In fact, the the song that I will play after you and I finish our conversation. Uh, titled Gravity Wins is, you know, it, it's it's hilarious. Well, thank you. It also happens to be autobiographical, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a little bit of all of us in each one of our songs, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not looking in the mirror, but there's looking over the shoulder of the guy in, or the person in the mirror, I guess is one yeah. way to put it. Well, see, what you sort of like displayed is something that I've noticed over the years. If I do, if I do a show or, and for that matter, produce an album. If you go through an album of mine, you'll notice that probably two-thirds of them are either upbeat or love songs are relatively hopeful or, or funny, you know. But it seems to be the, the ones that, um, that where I really uh, get people's attention, the ones people seem to remember the most are my sadder songs like Tip of My Tongue and, and you know, um, No Way Home. I mean, I think that they're just striking a nerve that maybe um, folks aren't used to having struck. I'm not sure. But for whatever reason, that's what people seem to remember. You know, It's almost like you dress up in a tuxedo and you wear pink shoes. Nobody remembers a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm a firm believer if you, if you are questionable in your talent, make sure you look good on stage. <laughs> well, hopefully I'm not questionable because I rarely look good on stage. <laughs> Uh, I don't believe that because I've seen you. You wear a, a, an open collar shirt extremely well, my friend. Well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. And you also wear a cowboy hat for it. You and Craig Cummings are the, my two favorite cowboy hat wearers. Really? Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. I was talking to a friend of mine by the name of Tim Stiles. He's a wonderful songwriter and he's living in Arizona. He was wearing a cowboy hat. And I said, man, you know, you look good in a cowboy hat. And he smiled. And he said, you know, these are ridiculous things to put on your head, you guys, but when you put them on, you got to own it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. Well, let's go back a little bit. You had mentioned you started out as a bass player, and how did your musical journey begin? Did you take piano lessons as a kid, or how did it all start? Well, I mean, I uh, the first time I really remember... Um, anything musical happened to me that's uh, sort of, I think, that, that got me interested in performing. I, I was, my first day, basically, in third grade, I'd switched schools from Beltsville to Laurel. And my uh, elementary school teacher said, does anybody, and I was in a singer, you know, a chorus class, I guess. Mrs. Tremarchi, I believe is what her name was. And she said, does anybody here sing? And I raised my hand. And she said, come on up and sing. And I sang, I want a beer just like a beer that pickled dear old mom. And uh, she was like so happy that I was willing to do that. I'm really, really rather shy person um, unless somebody asked me to sing. And uh, the next thing I know, I was singing in a little uh, uh, vocal group in elementary school, going around doing little fairs and little uh, 
festivals and stuff. And, um, you know, we did songs like uh, Red Light, Green Light, you know, Ran the Ten, you know, Peter, Paul and Mary and, uh, you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, John B. Sales and, uh, uh, you know, fast forward, you know, I go over to a buddy's house at 15 years old, um, long out of uh, elementary school. And um, there was two guitar players and a drummer and they were they were jamming around, you know, they were doing like Robin Trower and Jimi Hendrix and that kind of stuff. Um, I had an acoustic at home, but I barely played it. And uh, I realized they needed the bass player. So I told him, I asked him if he needed a bass player. And he said, yeah. I said, well, I play bass. I said, you do? I said, yeah. And I said, okay, come back next Wednesday. Then. And I went home and pleaded with my father to go out and buy me a bass. I said, I need to learn how to play bass in a week. Wow. And uh, he went out and bought me a Fender Telecaster bass and um, a little amplifier. And I showed up the next week. And uh, it didn't take him long to figure out. I really wasn't a bass player, but they didn't have one. So they said they'd teach me how to play. So I think the first song I learned was Two Rolling Stones or it was a Robin Trower song um, back in the early 70s. And uh, a few years later, you know, I had my ovation guitar and I went on down to Norfolk and started playing professionally, um, you know, for basically to, to, earn, to earn my money down there, um, Norfolk and Virginia Beach um, as a soloist. Uh, I had written a bunch of songs by then and wanted to get him out, so I was started my really my professional career mostly as a soloist. Um, we played a few gigs in the band, but nothing to really talk of. Um, and uh, and it, 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 as soon as I started playing acoustic out, I started doing probably about half my set was was original. So and it's continued to this day. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll do a few eclectic covers, but basically when I play out, I play most of my own stuff. So. Now, what got you to move from the Baltimore area to Norfolk in the first place? Actually, <clears throat> it was more about, uh, I had a buddy of mine that was going to school down there, and he was, and he said, I can hook you up with gigs right and left down here. If you come on down, we'll, we'll go ahead. And so he sort of played the role of music manager for me and, and started booking me around town. And um, so that was what drew me down there. Now, how long did you stay there before moving back to the uh, to our area? Well, I wrote a song about that. It's called Norfolk Town. And uh, so I would go down there for like several months at a time and come back home for, um, you know, like to a semester. Um, I would basically head down there for the, for the summer months, you know, the spring and the summer, when the crowds would be down there, and then I'd come back home. So I did that for, uh, you know, a couple of years, two, three years, and then... Uh, then started, uh, you know, playing uh, in the D.C. area and the Baltimore area a little bit more regularly. Now, did you um, have a day job while you were doing this, or you were a full-time musician? There was a, there was a time when I was a full-time musician, but recently I've been working steady for, for many years. I'm very fortunate to have a job that I can go in. Uh, it's very flexible, so I can go in late, so I can take off and go on, like, little excursions to South Carolina or Nashville or wherever I need to go um, to do the recording or play, you know, play a show. Now, what t- what line of work are you in, in your day job? And I think I lost you there, Tony. I'm not sure why. Oh, you're back now. What's that? I said Actually, you- still doing a lot of teleworking, so. Oh, okay. You know, so many people are, they sit in there, they move from their, their bedroom to the kitchen, to the dining room, or to the office, or the, the, the spare bedroom, whatever it turns out to be. And you uh, you must be driving through a dead spot. There you are, you're back yep. again. Yeah, I'm back. I will make sure that I'm no longer driving through a dead spot. Can you hear me good? Yep, yep, that's okay. That's, you know, that's, um, cell phones are absolutely wonderful. The technology has really... I mean, we can talk with someone as long as they're awake halfway across the globe <laughs> and as if they were, you know, sitting right next to us. Right. And, uh, and, and it doesn't cost us any more than our monthly fee. It's really wonderful. But yeah. occasionally there are mountains in the way or something or there's not a close enough tower, whatever it is. I, but, I think at this time of night, too, right when the sun goes down, I seem to have a little bit of trouble no matter where I'm at. Yep. <clears throat> so, yep. I don't know what it is. 
But yeah, so that's uh, that's pretty much been. I've been very fortunate to have a job that allows me to, to continue to play music as often as I like. I can play, you know, evenings. I can play away. I can I can do all sorts of things as long as I make up the work and have the leave to be able to take off and do it. Mm-hmm. So. Now, and you're too young to to retire soon. But when you do retire, do you have plans to become more involved with music? I think that I'm probably uh, going to keep playing you know as, as often i mean i'm in the studio all the time um and i play out you know several times you know sometimes a month i doubt if i'll do any more um but uh i'll certainly continue to go as long as my body will let me you mm-hmm. know as long as, I'm, as long as i'm physically capable i there's nothing really in the world that i like doing more than standing before an attentive audience and sharing um you know basically my songs with people, you know, basically singing about uh, the way I've either felt or the way I'm feeling. And I just love to share that with people. Well, so, I've, I've read some articles where uh, songwriters are being interviewed and they said that they can say in their songs what they can't say to someone in person in conversation. I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's true. It's like laying. You can, go, you can go to places that you wouldn't feel comfortable. Yeah. Typically. Yeah. You know. Now you mentioned Ovation guitar, and we all had Ovation guitars there for a while. <laughs> yeah. The what did you transition into from the Ovation? So when I when I started playing uh, in uh, the 2000 era, the Taylors were the thing, and um, they were really. Uh, I had a, a 714, a little concert series type guitar, so it wouldn't feed back. But eventually, I started uh, getting into Gibsons and um, really enjoyed the J45 and the LOO Gibson guitar. I also have a couple of Beard guitars. Oh. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed them. It's a wonderful luthier out of Hagerstown, as you well know, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I also bought a square neck. Uh, from him too, Dobro, which I, I feature on a lot of songs on uh, Gravity Winds, uh, which I you know put out in 2020, and um, and then just recently, I had uh, the you know f- a mutual friend of ours, Susie uh, Marklin, had a uh, showcase down in um, the Americana Fest, and she invited me down in Nashville, and then I had um, a couple of gigs that I swing by South Carolina, the Low Country, and played down there for a little. There's a wonderful little songwriter festival. It's an invitation only thing called Frog Frogstock. Um, so when I was in Charleston, um, getting ready for that show, I walked into the old guitar shop in um, in North Charleston there, and picked up a, a Martin and bought a Martin guitar. So I've got I've got a Martin, I've got a Collins, and I've got a Gibson, and I, and I love. Uh, of those three, uh, mostly Dreadnought. Um, if I'm playing out in a band, I'll play the LOO Gibson. Well, and that's the one you use when you fingerstyle for the most part, isn't it? Uh, actually, I'm starting to, I, I really love the Collins, um, but um, mostly I, when I play out locally, I'm playing my J45. The LOO, I'll, I'll fingerstyle with that sometimes. It depends on the song. But, um, but smells like rain. Uh, I don't know if you noticed how warm that song sounded. That's mm-hmm. my new. That's my new Martin. Oh, it sounded beautiful. I mean, that is a that song in and of itself has a wonderful warm feel to it. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that's that's the HD twenty eight. That's just I picked that guitar up. I, I had no intention of buying a guitar that day, and I was like, wow. That's the, that's the, that's the best way to buy a guitar. Yeah, absolutely. Not necessarily if you want to stay married, but it's a great way to get good. <laughs> now, I, it took me two listens, maybe even the third listen, before I heard the ghost second vocal in there. Yeah, that's Jen Smith, isn't she? Isn't she something? She is, and it's especially the first time you hear it, you don't quite hear it, and it's just it's, it's almost like the whisper. You know, when it's that little person on the shoulder sometimes who's whispering in your ear to say. I don't think you want to do that. Right. But it's exactly. it's it's almost not there and then she comes up a little bit in volume the second time around but it's it's wonderful. And again, I did not catch on to it until the second or third time listening through. I'm going, "Wait a minute. There's somebody else singing here." Yeah, it I think what it does is it gives you an effect of sort of space 
uh, early on. And then when the, the third verse, when she finally actually sings a harmony, then you, then it sort of brings into focus what's been kind of going on. But right. I think it's, it was a really nice touch, um, that, uh, that Scott and I, um, decided to sort of add to the song. Well, I noticed in your, um, press kit, cause I read through, through that before we, we got on air here and that you were very popular in the 2000s over in Europe. Oh yeah. I, I was very fortunate. Yep. Now, did you uh, ever, uh, travel over there to perform or was it strictly just on the radio and so forth over there? It was radio and write-ups and critiques and things. Um, if I was going to go over there, I'd actually started talking about going over to Denmark and the Netherlands. I was really pretty popular in Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands. It seemed maybe Belgium too. Now, how but did, I never really made the trip. How did they find you? Well, I think when I put out, um, time tells tales, uh, I want to call him Lord. Um, oh my gosh, I can't remember this guy's name. It started. He it was a German um, DJ, and I sent him um, a couple of songs, including, um, uh, you know, uh, the song that I wrote um, about, uh, you know, down I go and um, and kill them all, which is a song about nine eleven. Mm-hmm. And he wrote back and he said, you know, he said, I really need to send this to uh, a guy in Sweden um, and that there's this network called the Rainbow Network. And you need to hook into that. And then there was also Freeform Americana Radio here in the United States that has some um, overlap with some of the DJs over there. So it was really this guy um, in uh, in Germany that turned me on to uh, this entire network of freeform radio in Europe. Now, how yeah. did you meet him or learn about him in the first place? So I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, there was a indie Bible, the independent musician Bible. Mm-hmm. There was a book that was popular. Um, I guess it still is. But that was really helpful. And I got um, a couple of uh, a really great write-ups here in the States, um, uh, through uh, various uh, critics that I found uh, that was that was willing to take a guy that wasn't um, you know wasn't a level or whatever in terms of popularity and, and uh, marketing and uh, and then um, was able to hook into a couple of of cool guys over in Europe um, and um, and the book was very helpful uh, those those little marketing um, uh, rags that you can read and, and books for any young songwriters out there, any, anything like that, they really do sort of open doors. Now, have you been able to stay in contact with any of these folks over in Europe over the years? Oh yeah, I, you know, there's uh, there's Mike the Frenchie uh, from uh, you know uh, from France has actually um, come over and, and uh, flew over here and stayed with me a little bit. Um, uh, I've kept in touch with a, with a couple of guys over there that, um, uh, and a couple of gals um, that uh, continue to play my music and um, will send me messages from time to time and tell me they really like my my new release or they really like my new single or whatever. So it's been very gratifying. Yeah. Well, I've spoken to several local, regional, and even one or two national uh, singer songwriters who say that they're more popular in Europe than they are in the United States. And I, oh, yeah. that, that's always amazed me. Well, the funny thing too is so, you know, they, they're really into roots rock Americana over there or, or Americana folk. Um, the, you know, the, uh, the, the guys that I hooked into. And um, when I put out already gone, um, it came in, you know, it was number two in the Euro Americana charts. Um, I was getting spun all, all the time over there, and they really, really liked it. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, Julian Welch, uh, his uh, guitar player, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, he got number one, I got number two, and then I think like John Hyatt was like four or five or something. It was crazy. Now, that's, but, um, that's the song Already Gone, right? So it was the whole album uh, got, uh, you know, came in number two. Um, in the Euro Americana charts, and one of the guys over there um, wrote me, and he said, "There's a song on the album called Ugangula, <clears throat> and um, uh, in it, uh, you know, it's, it's talking about uh, banging bones against boulders and things like that. So, 
one of the things we did in terms of production was uh, we used some bongos and some, uh, you know, some rhythm instruments, percussive uh, rhythm instruments, um, to sort of uh, have a little fun with it. And he wrote complaining. He said, that's not real Americana when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, dude, man, you're like, you live in Belgium. Like, don't tell me what Americana yeah, is. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> but they're really into it, man. They're purists over there. And they, they are on fire about American folk and American um, roots and, and, you know, bluegrass, Americana, country. They just love that stuff over there. Well, you know, when you read about the early Beatles and the groups of that early 1960s time frame in Great Britain. They talk about the music of the United States, that they were just so in love with it, and they would wait for somebody who was in Merchant Marine to go over and pick up albums and bring them back, and they'd all sit around and listen. And that's how they basically learned a lot of those songs. Mm-hmm. So, maybe it's, so maybe it's that same thing. It's like... You know, in the 1960s and early 1970s, I was in love with British rock and roll. Oh, and, yeah. And so it's, it's like a two-way street almost. Yeah. And, it, you know, like I say, the the funny thing is, is that they're so into the more ro- the rootsier it is, like like they really, really off of Under the Church, they really liked um, Bad Boys Blues. You know, they really liked that song because it's, you know, it's just got that... Um, it's a rootsy kind of bluegrassy kind of um, folky tune. That's the one that they spun mostly, it seemed to me. And then um, uh, Gravity Winds was sort of popular, but also off of that album, um, you know, one of the songs that's super sort of folky country, you know, um, I didn't think it was going to be very popular, but they loved it over there. It was, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, a song towards the end of the album. Glimmer uh, or the sentence or when the morning comes? Well, uh, that, that's off of Under the Church. I'm talking about Gravity Winds. Oh, 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 oh. The um, Coldest Sunday or Anywhere? Coldest Sunday. Yeah. 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 Coldest Sunday. They loved it. And it was, and I thought, it's, this is like really countryfied. And, um, you know, it's it's a little, and it's too country for some taste and folk, I think, in America. You know, it's like they wouldn't know if it's country or folk. and couldn't figure out what it is maybe i thought well let's Um, listen to about 30 seconds of bad boy blues and then we'll go over and listen to uh, about 30 seconds of coldest sunday so people can get a feel for what they liked over there is that fair okay yeah sounds cool here comes bad boys blues I'm a fool Left me sitting on the side of the road With the wish there was a bad boy blue Well, that's Bad Boys Blues, and let's uh, listen to a little bit of Coldest Sunday. That's uh, every man's tagline. She's not in love with me. <laughs> oh, such is life, right, Tony? Well, it seems to be such is life. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's so cool. And what I would love to do, with your permission, 
is we you know we don't have time in the the hour or so we're chatting this evening but with your permission i would love to do a second podcast playing your top 10 of all the songs you've written your favorite top 10 or top 8 whatever you want to do so uh, what i'm going to have you do is i'll send you an email and then you send me an email back and give it some thought and tell me which ones are your your favorites that sounds great. Thank and, you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And then why? Just a very, you know, one sentence as to why or two sentences. And so when, before I play the song, I'll tell people why you liked it. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah. And we'll do that over the next couple of weeks and uh, have fun with it. How about that? That sounds like a ball. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're most welcome. The um, So what's coming up? Well, today is the 14th of March. People will begin hearing this. If I can get it up and loaded tonight, they'll hear it later tonight, uh, but most likely tomorrow. You have a show tomorrow evening somewhere. I, I saw it on Facebook, I think. Yeah, there's a Songwriters Association of Washington, Songwriters in the Round. And um, I, I think her name is Kerchak. Uh, it's her last name. She's a ukulele. And I can't remember the gentleman I'm playing with, but it's a it's a, at Hank Deedle's Tavern. Starts at 8 o'clock. And um, uh I'm playing again um, just to open for uh, a, a entity, another band um, on Saturday at the same in the same club. Uh, playing at uh, Cooper House uh, House Concerts. Oh, it's um, a great I, great house concert series. Yeah, they they've honored me with I'm I'm the they were down since COVID and they're starting back up and I'm the first one they invited back. So. Oh, what an honor that is! I know I'm just thrilled. So that's that's uh, March 25th. I think there's a waiting list though so, um, because it's such a popular um, house concert. But if you could check that out, if somebody's interested, they could maybe get on the waiting list and perhaps break through. And then um, of course next month. I'm doing my own song. I'm hosting guest hosting for Angie Miller at the second uh, su- second Monday um, uh, songwriter showcase at 49 West in Annapolis, 49 West uh, Coffee and Wine Bar, and that's a Monday night show. I'm going to have guests uh, Billy Coulter and sure. Ruthie Log Ruthie Logston. Oh wow! Yeah, of Ruthie and the Wranglers. So the three of us will be making some noise down there uh, in early April. Oh, that's terrific. I believe that's April 10th. Yes, I think it is. I've got it up on the website right now. So yeah. you, do you like to do maybe three or four gigs a month? Is that the most comfortable for you? Yeah, that's that's. I think that's a nice clip. Um, it's hard for me to travel too far. So, um, you know, uh, play one in Annapolis, play one, in, you know, in Rockville, play one in Columbia, try to spread it out a little bit, maybe mm-hmm. Northern Virginia once in a while. And then, um, you know, see old friends, you know and uh, uh, people that I've gotten to know over the years. It's really amazing, you know, how many uh, friends and fans that I've made um, over the last 20, 30 years playing music around the region. Well, I will have to put you in contact with my my good friend Tom Kolhep, and he has a company called Key West Productions, and he produces quite a few shows, both at the Weinberg in Frederick and also at the new Spire Arts stage, which is across the street from the Weinberg. The Weinberg seats between 1,100 and 1,200. It's a huge, a huge concert hall. You may even have actually gone there to see somebody at some point, but the Spire Arts stage has a total seating due to the fire marshal limit. The fire marshal limits it at 282, but the average crowd in there is 125 to 150. And it is very intimate. The sound is fantastic. And for the listeners like myself who go even sitting in the last row you're so close to the performer you know many of these large venues you you get a seat that's i don't know how many you know 30 or 40 rows back and you just can't make out the the facial expressions really you can see them but you can't see them and the um, the spire art stage is wonderful well i I really appreciate it that'd be great and uh you know, over the over the years, I, I always uh, one of my favorite photos ever taken of me on stage is one of you taking me and one of me and Gant Kushner. We were playing the uh, Monday Night Brewers Alley. Uh, I, I that so, is one of my favorite photos too. Isn't that something? <laughs> that's a great photo. But uh, you captured uh, facial expressions and then some with yep. that shot. So. Yeah, no, that's uh, <laughs> and I had lost many of those photos for a number of years because I had a hard drive crash. 
Oh, no. And I wasn't backing things up like you're supposed to. And I was able to, believe it or not, find them. I had I had put, and I think yours was one I actually did have, but the um, I had to find many of them on Facebook because I, for a while there I was posting them on Facebook. So that was the only way I could retrieve them because I took my computer into an IT guy. He goes, no, it's toast. Oh, no. Let's see, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg saved your tail on that one. Yep, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, gosh, Tony, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for agreeing to chat with me. This has been great. Well, Todd, it's always fun to talk with you. It's it's especially uh, fun to talk about, uh, you know, music and the music business and some of my songs with you tonight. So thank you so much. Well, and like I said, I'm going to send you an email and you sit down when you have, you know, a few minutes to come up with your top 10 or top eight, you know, doesn't make that much of a difference. I can comfortably get eight to 10 songs in an hour on, as long as I don't chat too much in between the, uh, (laughs) but that'll be a lot of fun, especially if you give me a little summary of, of what, what it's about or why you wrote it. I'd love to, uh, that'd be a lot of fun. I really look forward to it. All right. Well, listen, you have a good rest of your evening and we will chat soon. Yeah, thanks a lot. Be well. All right, Tony. Bye bye now. Bye bye. That was Tony Danikis. What a great fellow, great songwriter. He has some great, great songs. And I know I've used great three or four times in the last 10 seconds, but I'll say it again. He's a great songwriter. And I mentioned Gravity Wins, and this is the YouTube version of the song. And what I love about it is there's something at the beginning of the song, which is actually not part of the original recording. And here it is. Hey, Tony. Yeah. What's the song about? It's about allergies and drinking. Allergies? Yeah. Every time I drink, I break out in handcuffs. When I was born, I was thirsty, boys. I've been thirsty ever since. Took a shiny rock, the liquor like to make a convict wince. I'd get too damn good by Thursdays, then I was drowned in bathtub gin. If I get any, that's too many gravity wins. I've busted half a dozen times before I was 21. Waking up in Laurel City Jail ain't the way to have your fun. Sergeant Harris used to rap my case at the weekend when done you in. If I get any, that's too many gravity wins. You think I learned my lesson a long, long time ago. But when Friday night came rolling round, it was if I didn't know that you can't say where you go. If you can't say where you've been, if I get any, that's too many gravity wins. She's barely four foot five Had the cutest little kitty cat Could eat a man alive Now I've been smitten by her kitten But we're better off as friends If I get any, that's too many Gravity wins If I get any, that's too many Gravity wins If I get any, that's too many Gravity wins The Wispy Mop Music Acoustic Radio Podcast Series is produced by me, Todd Middle Initial C. Walker. Yes, that's right, it's me, at the Wispy Mop Music Studio in Frederick, Maryland. All music on the podcast is played by permission from the artist. If you're enjoying the series, please feel free to share the link, wispymopmusic.podbean.com, or it's either on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Thanks again to Tony Zanikas for a wonderful conversation, and we'll catch everybody next time.